All right, everybody, we're going to begin. My name is Dr. Andrew Sheen. I'm the Chief Academic Learning Officer at Bridgepoint, and it is an honor to introduce Dr. Craig Swenson, our president of Ashford University. Just a quick uh, shout out to Morgan and the entire TLSL team. I know we're midway through, but you guys have done a great job. Also a shout out, we have, um, I believe for the first time, an event like this being streamed live to students. So if you are a student and you are watching this, I want you to know that you are why we are here and we are so honored to have you join us today. So if you can hear this, we're gonna give you a round of applause as well. <laughs> All right, so I have a, um, a long list of distinguished um, qualities that Dr. Swenson has that I'm going to read off in more of a formal way. I'll try to be quick, but I have to do a few personal notes, um, given that I have a good relationship with Craig and have gotten to know him over the years. So first, I got a chance to meet him when he was um, the interim president at University of Rockies, and getting a chance to work with Craig, if I could equate it to something, have you ever seen the commercial where the guy is listening to the Bose speakers in the chair? and like the wind is blowing so hard, he's like being blown back. That's what it's like working with Craig, kind of like a hair blowing back experience, and I love it. <laughs> Craig is a, a, like a pitcher with all the pitches. Um, he knows marketing, he knows teaching and learning, he knows the business side, but he also has a heart for students. And as I'm thinking about pitching, I'm thinking about the Cubs. So I know I probably shouldn't <laughs> pitch that, but gosh darn it, go Cubs. Uh, he can quote Shakespeare at random, theorists quotes on cue, uh, more importantly, somebody's made a great impact on higher education, and I know he'll do the same for Ashford. And lastly, he's somebody who I personally consider as a mentor and I admire greatly. All right, a more formal introduction. Dr. Craig Swenson joined Ashford in May of 2016. As president and chief executive officer, Dr. Swenson is responsible for the overall quality and operations of Ashford University. More than 30 years of experience in higher education, Dr. Swenson is recognized as a national leader in higher education. Prior to being interim president at University of Rockies and president of Ashford, he served as chancellor of Argosy System for seven years and held the position of chief academic officer for Education Management Corporation for several years. Before his tenure at Argosy, he was the provost and vice president of academic affairs at Western U Governors University, and prior to that, he served as provost and senior vice president of academic affairs over the University of Phoenix. He serves on many boards, He's um, consulted the Department of Education. He served on very distinguished committees, such as the U.S. Army Educational Advisor Committee. And more importantly, he's a great guy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Craig Swenson. Well, good morning. <clears throat> I have to start with something very important. I'd all like you all to raise your hands, raise your right arm, repeat after me. I pledge that tonight I will root for the Chicago Cubs. This is a historic day, so I, the, the curse has got to end tonight. No offense to the Cleveland Indians fans. Well, I'm, I'm excited to be here because I get to do something that I love to do, and that is to teach. And it's been the hardest part of doing having taking the different jobs that I have in higher education because they've kept me from doing what I really love and so I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm one of those truly lucky people whose whose vocation and avocation happen to have joined and uh, and that doesn't happen uh, very often. I put my timer on so I don't so I know how much I'm going over. Um, <coughs> I'd, I'd like to start out by, with, with a question, and um, it is this one. Uh, this comes, uh, this is the title of the last chapter of a book by uh, uh, three uh, e education luminaries themselves, uh, Rich Boyatzis, uh, Scott Cowan, and David Kolb. And for the education folks, you'll, most of you remember, you know who David Kolb is. They wrote a book called Innovation in Professional Education that was a chronicle of the re-engineering of the MBA program at Case Western Reserve University at the Weatherhead School. And this was the title of their last chapter, What If Learning Were the Purpose of Education? Um, and I'd like you to think about that. What, <clears throat> first of all, what does that imply? What, why would they imply that learning is not the purpose of education? Anyone? 
I'll, re I'll repeat your comments so everyone can hear it. Okay, for, so from the student side, it's often instrumental. It, it's not as much about the learning. We hope as faculty members that will change. It's about getting the credential. That's what's important to students. How about on the other side? When they, I think, because I think there's a faculty aspect to this. Okay, thank you. There's more of an emphasis on delivering knowledge than on whether it's necessarily learned. And I, I think that's probably the most critical aspect of, of what they mean. We give lip service to learning. And we assume that learning is taking place just because we're teaching. Uh, in fact, um, I had a colleague when I was at Western Governors, uh, Janet Schnitz, who was the dean of the Teachers College, who used to, when she would present, she would use a, she would say, now, parents want to send their kids to get a higher education, believing that it's going to change their lives for the better. And it's a black box. And the, it's like the professors are saying, send us your children. They'll go into the black box, and while they're in there, something magic will happen. We can't tell you how we do it, and you, don't, you wouldn't really understand because we have PhDs and you don't, but that's what will happen. Just trust us. Well, in higher education in our society, we are less trusting of that now than we've ever been, that, that assumption that learning is happening. In fact, uh, if you go to that next slide, this is what Boyatzis, Cowan, and Kolb say. It's a mistake to assume that teaching and learning are the same thing. What you teach is not necessarily what I learn, and what I learn may be other than what you think. Now, <clears throat> if learning were the purpose of education, we wouldn't do a lot of the things that we do in higher education. Would we stand a professor up in front of a lecture hall with 500 sleepy students at 7.55 on a weekday morning and proceed to lecture to them for an hour and assume that learning is, is taking place? Would we, if, if learning were the purpose of education, uh, we, probably, we may not do that. I, I'm sure that many of you went through that wonderful rite of passage as undergraduates in large lecture halls. And for how many of you was that the optimal educational experience? Okay. Then why do we do that? When we know that lecture by itself, by itself is the least effective way to teach, why do we, do, why do we insist on doing it that way? It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So why? Why do we keep? T tell me. Somebody, explain this to me. That's the way it's always been done. That's the way it's always been done. Okay. That's not actually true. If you think back to, um, to uh, ancient Greece, when Socrates uh, started to corrupt the morals of the youth of Athens, which is why he was killed, he didn't do that. How did Socrates do it? He asked questions. It's the method that many law schools continue to use today. It's the, called the Socratic method for that reason because it relies on questioning. And Socrates, Socrates was very sly because he would say, you know, I'm not very smart. And so I like to talk to smart people and ask them what they think. And in the process, he would get them to tell him. And he would turn that into, uh, into teaching moments for those of you who have read, have read Plato's dialogues. There is a theoretical assumption that lecture follows. And it's uh, what, what I guess you could call it the empty vessel theory. Human beings are empty vessels. The kids are tabula rasa, just waiting to be written on. But our job is to open the head and pour in the knowledge. Okay. That's not education. Paulo Freire 
calls that banking education. And he makes it a political act that we, um, <clears throat> it, it's the job of the state and the state schools to, to make sure to inculcate all of the values that the state wants them to have. Okay. And, and he fought against, uh, against that kind of approach. So why do we keep doing it? Well, for one thing, lecturing is fairly easy to do. I mean, con conducting real facilitation of learning uh, is, is hard. I, I used to, when I was uh, teaching all the time, I would teach four-hour blocks in the evening. And by the end of that night, I was absolutely exhausted. And, and it was really hard work. <clears throat> but, I, but I took it very seriously. Um, lecture doesn't create the kind of deep learning that really engages. Now, I don't, I, I, I will tell you, I don't knock lectures. First of all, when I hear people say, we, I, I heard a, one of our faculty members in the past, my faculty members say, well, we don't use the L word. And I said, what, what do you mean we don't use the L word? We don't lecture here. And I said, well, sometimes when you go to class and the students haven't done their reading, and that never happens, I know, but sometimes when you go, your students don't know, they don't have enough of a vocabulary to act on. And so you need to give them a vocabulary. Now, Stephen Brookfield says that shouldn't be any longer than 20 minutes because by that time you've lost them. But it has a place. And sometimes we establish a context and a baseline of knowledge and, and then people can react to that. But that doesn't, that doesn't always happen. We don't always follow it with those other things. And here's the other part of it that I think, one of the reasons I think we do it because we've always done it, and that is <clears throat> the, the lecture test model that is so predominant, particularly in undergraduate education in the US, um, has become an economic construct. I can put one faculty member up in front of 500 students, and I've decreased the unit cost of education and I don't think that many institutions could balance the books if it were not for that because the tuition of those 500 students uh, goes to subsidize other really important things, football teams and football teams. Um, <clears throat> the real casualty of that too is assessment. If you think about learning assessment, when in those kinds of classes, you generally uh, are doing objective kinds of tests, true, false, and multiple choice tests, which tests one which small part of your knowledge, but not really the higher order cognitive skills that we need to develop. And so uh, <clears throat> I, I, I think that's important. I want to go back to, I mentioned Stephen Brookfield on, on lectures. He did say, he said, the reason you have to do that sometimes is because people can't think critically about nothing. You sometimes have to give them something to, to, to think about. Now, <clears throat> that's why I say if learning were the purpose of education, we wouldn't do some of the things that we would do, and that's an example. But what about online education? Is there anything we do that if learning were the purpose of education, we wouldn't do? Okay. In online education, is, <clears throat> is there anything, if learning were the purpose of education, is there anything we do that if that were really our goal, we wouldn't do? Hmm? We look for efficiencies. And what's wrong with that? Okay. So you have to balance that with the learning that takes place. Okay. Tony? Okay, Did, I don't know if you all heard that, but uh, uh, Tony Farrell, who's the, our Dean of Education uh, of our College of Education said that you would 
build more scaffolding. You would, you would have learning follow its own natural progression rather than forcing it into uh, this time. Okay, one, it, that online education, partially due to efficiencies in seeking scale, that it becomes pretty cookie cutterish, doesn't it? Uh, and, and those are the kinds of questions that we ought to be asking ourselves if learning is the purpose of what we do, and it is, we are a teaching institution, then we ought to look for ways that what, for those things that we're doing that don't produce that, that result. Now, <coughs> how, I, I guess I want to turn that around and say, how, how do we teach so that we get the best result and, and, and that we create an environment where students can learn? I want to go back to that first quotation. Um, it is a mistake to assume that teaching and learning are the same thing. What you teach is not necessarily what I learn. How do we make our way through, through that minefield? Let me go to the next slide. Uh, Herb Simon, um, <coughs> Herbert Simon was a Nobel Prize winner, uh, an expert in art artificial intelligence, uh, truly one of the great scholars in cognitive psychology, and, uh, and a political scientist to boot. And Herb Simon said this, learning results from what the student does and thinks and only from what the student does and thinks. The teacher can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. Now, it, think about the implication of that. <clears throat> that, um, that sort of, if I were tempted to think I was great shakes as a teacher, uh, based on those last two uh, quotations, that might melt my wings and bring me crashing to earth, back to earth like Icarus. Uh, it's true, I think, that the most important question that we ask ourselves as teachers is what do I do what, what, how can I best influence what the student does to learn? And so I'm, I'm going to spend, uh, I think, the rest of this time talking about that. And the time is going way too fast. Um, I, I think many of you are familiar with, with Bloom, Benjamin Bloom and Bloom's taxonomy. Well, Bloom had uh, a, another part of what Bloom did was he looked at domains of learning. Okay? And the first uh, domain is the cognitive domain. And that's what we normally think of when we think about education. We think about the content, covering the material. That's, that's what we're there for. We're there to get that knowledge. And, and that's a precursor of that empty vessel uh, approach. But the second domain, there are three domains. The second is the affective, and the third is the, the psychomotor. Okay? And I'm just going to talk about the, the first two, but particularly the, the affective domain. The affective domain has to do more with uh, our emotions, our, our feelings, our passions. And sometimes as faculty members in higher education, there is a tendency to forget that side of it. And we focus on the content and the material and how the, the, the resources they're, they're using and are they reading the books and how are we sharing that material and th that's, that's what a lot of the focus is. And if you listen to those lectures <coughs> in those big classrooms or in smaller classrooms, that's pretty much the approach. By and large, it's I'm, I am all about the content. And I would like to suggest uh, that we were starting at the wrong point. Uh, some of you have heard me tell this story. 
Uh, the story is told of a young professor just starting out, taught his first section in one of those big lecture classes that's, you know, there were 20 or 30 sections full of undergraduates, and they had a departmental exam. And this professor's, new professor's students didn't do very well. And the uh, dean called him in and she said, Professor, I have to tell you, your, your results on, uh, on this um, departmental exam that we measure against, what, it wasn't very good. <clears throat> and his response was, I covered the material. I covered all the material. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. To which the, uh, the dean replied, your job isn't to force them to drink, it's to make them thirsty. And that's the, that's the gateway, I think, to, to the affective domain. Um, David Hume, Scottish empiricist philosopher, said this. He said, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. He felt that we act first from emotion and then reason comes from that. That we are motivated to do certain things by our will. And that will is based on passion, not necessarily on reason. And I think that, it, that for me, was a, was a key insight to what I think is, is, is critical here. Um, I believe that the cognitive domain, that content and the, the stuff that we teach, is only reached through the affective domain. Now, there are certain people who don't need teachers. They will learn in spite. You know, you know I, when we think of, uh, of uh, self-taught human beings, autodidacts, you think of Abraham Lincoln, for example, whose hunger for learning. I've just been listening to an, a biography of Alexander Hamilton, the same thing. Insatiable desire to learn and immerse himself or herself in everything. And, and that's... It's like Demosthenes, you know, you, 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 until you can't breathe, you know, it, it's, it's air to you to learn. But there are a lot of us who are like that, particularly on some subjects. And so that's, that's the big part of this. Uh, <clears throat> one educational entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur that I have some, had some significant experience with uh, created a new model for teaching adults. And his point was that the key to what he did to creating that model was that he placed equal emphasis on the affective as on the cognitive. Because he knew that it was the affective domain when we touch it that spurs people to want to, to, to learn what they're supposed to learn. Uh, <clears throat> One of my grad school mentors, if we go to the next slide, developed uh, this concept. Organizational change, he says, and he's dealing with, with or organizational learning, but I think the principle is the same, is a process, the four E's, he calls it. Notice the first two. The first two are excite and experience, then execute. That's where the content comes in and then evaluate, so it's looped learning. Now, that 50%, to me, corresponds with the affective domain. You see kids get excited about learning, and you also see kids sit in classrooms and literally die away. There are some reasons, and the reason generally speaking, is because that teacher who gets those kids excited and you see a classroom that's just buzzing with positive energy, and it's no different for adults, that teacher knows how to tap the affective. <clears throat> and, and I believe that as much as I believe anything. And so our question is, how do we make them thirsty? Uh, now, we've all heard people say it. You, you hear it all the time about business. Business is all about relationships. Education is all about relationships. We're social animals. 
uh, we humans. And with, with some exceptions, uh, Lincoln and Hamilton and others, most of us learn in a social setting. And we need motivation. We draw upon the strength and the excitement of others to make learning, make us want to learn and, and to make us hungry. Um, <clears throat> teachers, teachers who make a difference tend to shine in that area, in relationships. There, there is something about it. Um, so a big part of figuring out how to make our students thirsty, thirsty enough to want to drink long and deep is the relationships we establish with them. Uh, Nancy Schla Schlossberg, a, a scholar, uh, in fact, uh, Charlie Minnick, who's the uh, campus president of our Iowa campus, sent, uh, sent us, a few of us this uh, article. He said, the amount of student learning and personal development associated with any educational program is directly proportional to the quality and quantity of student involvement in that program. The effectiveness of any educational policy or practice is directly related to the capacity of that policy or practice to increase student involvement. Now that's, that's very scholarly language. What is it that gets students involved? It's excitement and it comes from relationships. Um, I, I know that some students are motivated, they'll learn it in spite of me and my job is to get out of their way. <clears throat> but more often than not, that motivation for them comes through us. I've always found fascinating the, um, the professor who uh, congratulates him or herself on the fact that they are so rigorous that half of their students fail the final exam. Well, what's the question you ask when you hear that? What does that say about how good a teacher you are. That's a professor who didn't, didn't get it. <clears throat> Motivation happens because when, when our students come to believe that they matter to us, when they become human beings, when, when, when they know that we care whether or not they're there and that they're worthy of our making an investment in them. That's, that's where it comes. That's where relationship comes. I can think back to <clears throat> elementary school and middle school and high school, my bachelor's program, my master's program, my doctoral program. I was thinking as I was preparing uh, today, <clears throat> I and mean, it makes me emotional, but uh, I have uh, Paul Miller, my fifth grade teacher, um, Linda Arnell, my seventh grade English teacher, Kim Burningham, my debate coach in high school, um, Perry Sorensen, my advisor in my undergraduate program, who was a great old flat-footed, wall-eyed, former FBI agent mentor in public relations, who was unbelievable. Uh, Brent Peterson, whose 4E model you saw in my master's program, and Mark Rossman in my doctoral program. At each of those levels, I had at least one faculty member who reached down and looked at me as an individual and got me excited and plugged in. and. And, and made me want to learn because they cared about me. Um, I, I called, I tracked down Paul Miller. I went to West Bountiful Elementary School in, uh, in Utah and um, I, I, I tracked him down and, and about six months ago. <clears throat> and it was not easy, and I, but I called him and I asked him if he remembered me. And he said, well, of course I do. And, uh, we had the longest talk, and he said, and I felt, he said, I can't tell you how much this means to me. You wonder sometimes if you made a difference. And uh, were it not for Paul Miller, I probably would not be here today. Now, I, 
that these amazing, and I bet every one of you can think of that same thing. I, it reminds me of the song from, uh, from Wicked. I've, <clears throat> I've been changed for the better, and because of you, I've been changed for good. And, and that's how I feel. Um, so I want to repeat my belief that, that we get students engaged in the subject matter, in the content, through exciting them about it, through caring about them and exciting. <clears throat> now, in a, here's one problem. Here's our challenge. The next slide. It was much easier for me when I was in front of a classroom of 20 adult students, most of whom were there because they wanted to be, not because their parents expected them to be. Um, and so I had a leg up. It was very easy to create relationships. The, the venue was small. The, the size was small. Um, I had a much easier time. But I have to tell you, that doesn't get us off the hook when we teach online, we're still under the same obligation and learning still happens the same way and for the same reasons. But it does place limitations on us and our ability to do that. And so that's what I'd like us to talk about uh, just a bit. Okay, I have time to go. Um, <coughs> how do we do that? And I know that many of you have taught online as much as I have. I've taught plenty. But some of you have had some experiences. And so I'd, I, I would like to ask you to, to share um, and ask, how, let's start with the concept of relationship. How do, how do we, how do you as teachers, or how have you as students felt that your teachers developed relationships online? What were the things they did? That, uh, have you had faculty members that did that online, and how did they do it? Any, anyone? They closed the week. They'd always come back and follow up. <clears throat> they closed the loop. It's like on the 4E model. You, you know, excite, experience, execute, and evaluate. Okay. That, all right. That terrific. Anybody else? Yes? Thank you. Uh, a picture. Um, all about you. So that you become, if you want them to become, a, them to see you as caring about them, you have to give them a reason to care. And so it's something about you that will allow them to engage with you and feel like they know you. Uh, a little video that that talks about you. I, I, I saw a picture of one of our faculty members in a course and the couple of dogs under her arms and you know it, it just made her a human being. All right. Okay. I I would call that outreach. You know, one on one mentorship, seeing somebody who's struggling and making and reaching out to them. And I don't have, I, I don't know what our policy is on calling students, but I happen to think it's a terrific idea. If somebody's struggling or if somebody's done something amazing, you know, a, a quick phone call communicates volumes about caring. I've always thought handwritten notes, you know, we, we operate in that medium, but, but I, I get a kick out of receiving and sending handwritten notes. I think they're far more meaningful than, than emails. So there are little things that we can do. And then find out about them. Get them to share something that you can hold on to. And it's not just that they're sharing with the rest of the class. It's that you're, you are coming to appreciate them as a unique, uh, special human being. And when they sense that, it goes back, they, they will learn to the degree that they understand that you value them and care about them. 
um, that Nancy Schlossberg's, her, the theory is called mattering theory, that they matter to us. That's a good start and it gets, the, it gets us engaged. So once that's happened, um, once they know who we are, and we, we hope that they're now, they sense that we value them, then they're possibly ready to learn. And uh, how do we get them then to engage with the subject? How do you get them engaged with the subject? Anyone have an idea? Okay. How do you mean? Make it. Jeff says make it personal. Okay. You make it relevant to them. Malcolm Knowles says that adults have a need to know why they need to do something before they'll set out to learn it. And you think about that with our lives. We live busy lives. We have lots of roles. There's always stuff crushing in. And I am far less likely to take up something that I don't perceive as beneficial to me or important or to give it, be half-hearted about it. Um, Paulo Freire. Uh, Paulo Freire, uh, who I mentioned before, um, believed in creating a, a situated context for learning. Paulo Freire taught the uh, farmer peasants in the Andes how to read as to help in, engage them in, in their ability to make their lives better because they were able to uh, understand uh, what was going on politically around them and, and having to do with their struggle. He didn't teach them to read by having them read Dick and Jane. They read the newspapers and pamphlets that related to their struggle. And those were harder than Dick and Jane, but because it was something that was important to them, and, and not only important, but critical for them, who wanted to make the world a better place for their children uh, and, and, and for their communities, they learned. And that's because he was able to, to make it relevant. Uh, John Dewey and David Kolb. John, John Dewey uh, said we do it, we learn by doing. And notice on that 4E model, the second uh, uh, was experience. And if any of you know David Kolb's model, David, his uh, uh, pr process learning, there is a process of examining your theory in use, going out to test that theory, reflecting on it, and then adapting your theory based on, on what, you're, uh, what you've learned by really thinking. Um, and, and John Dewey and, and uh, Stephen Brookfield and David Kolb all had some of the same approach when they said, if it's right that we learn by doing, where the learning really becomes deepened is when we are led, induced to reflect on it. John Dewey used to say uh, a, lot of what, a lot of what passes for thinking, for many of us, isn't thinking at all. Real thinking, the kind of reflective thinking where you sit down and grapple with something and, and you, you've, you're feeling cognitive dissonance and you've got to figure out how to resolve that cognitive dissonance and, and you create a new theory to test, that's where deep learning comes from. But people don't always do that. And in fact, we are programmed, at least I was thinking back to my grade school days, we're programmed to sit still, not make noise, read, follow directions, when in fact, if you look at those classrooms that are buzzing, th there's a those teachers know how to keep order, but it's ordered chaos because they know that kids learn when they engage and are excited. I have a five-year-old who I was so blown away when we met with his teacher because she said, well, you know, I've, uh, Aiden is really a kinesthetic learner. 
He's active and busy. And so um, I've created a place for a couple of the kids where when they just can't stand it, they have a place to go and, and, and sit and move around. And, and I thought, you are brilliant. Thank you for caring enough about my child to do that, to, to learn to observe him as an individual and based on your, those cues to determine what it was he needs. And um, he wasn't so sure about school, but he's, he's loving it and wants to get up most days and, uh, and go. So that thinking is hard work. How, how, do we, how do we convert this into learning in an online environment? Um, I'm just about the end because I'd like to open for questions and, and discussion. But let me suggest a, a few things that I think are, are critical. Uh, first of all, if, if we've connected, then we can start to teach. Our students are ready to learn. If we can create excitement for it. Well, how do we do that? Number one is real discussions. Okay. Um, I have to tell you that one of the problems, and some of you have heard me rail against our discussion boards. Uh, students game them. Faculty members see them as, in some cases, as a burden. And the problem we have at scale is there's such wide variation in how they're administered. And, and we're looking for other ways to engage students uh, using the, the kinds of social media platforms that they engage in freely every day and, and interact with other people. What if we could turn those kinds of principles into education? I, I think that's going to be critical. But we have what we have now. And I will tell you that students know when a, a faculty member is phoning it in because they see it in those discussions. There is, when I was, I, I used to teach um, new faculty and, and prepare them for the classroom. And I would say, okay, I want you to define facilitation for me, because we facilitate learning. And uh, they would say, well, you get, it's a, you get a discussion going. I say, no, that's not facilitation. That's, you may be facilitating a discussion, but you're not facilitating learning. Facilitating learning is whatever it takes. Whatever it takes is the thing that you do to facilitate learning. As far as discussion boards, faculty members who are involved and in guiding the discussion. Uh, I, I, I saw last week, I got a little better glimpse into how we do them. I think, we've, I think there are some changes that we can make there. So that it really is a discussion that students and faculty members are engaging in. It ought to be no different than we do in a regular classroom. But if the faculty member is not there and not really engaged, they're not going to be there. They will do the minimum, and they game the system. And, um, and I think we all know that that's very surface. So that's one, real discussions. The second, I would say, is high expectations. Now, what, that's one of the challenges, especially when you're dealing with students who come with risks, because you want to get them over the hump. And so we have our best, most nurturing faculty on those early courses. But sometimes when they get to a course where now this is getting hard, they're not prepared. Their expectations haven't been properly set for what they're going to go through, and they give up way too easily. So if, if we think about that, uh, there, there's probably no more robust finding in all of the literature of psychology than the relationship of goal setting and task performance. And we know that faculty members who convey, first of all, caring, but then high expectations, that students will generally do what they have to do to reach that mark. But that's, that, that's harder work for us, too. 
because it takes more on our part. Um, the third is feedback. And I preach this, uh, I think if we wanted to affect retention, uh, really affect retention, we would increase the volume and quality of feedback on student work, both in the discussion boards but, but on their work. I, I think Waypoint is wonderful and I love it, but I will tell you one of the things, one of the parts of Waypoint that I have problems with are the, the response bank that a faculty member can go and click and it puts it in. And we know from some, from, uh, some groups that we did, focus groups we did with students that by the time they've seen that same comment from one faculty member or more, two or three times, they know that this isn't genuine. It's easy, it makes it faster for us, and I understand why we do it, but if you think about what the student gets, that doesn't, that doesn't reinforce that sense that I'm a indiv unique individual. You're just giving me boilerplate. So I, I think if, if we increased, significantly increased the level of feedback that students get on, on, their, uh, written, uh, on their work projects, that we would see uh, an increase in pass rate, in GPA, and in retention onto the next class. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that that is true. Now, I also am smart enough to know that there are structural barriers to that. Uh, class size, um, the, the number of hours that people can work uh, in, in a week, all of those things create structures that auger against this. So we've got to figure out ways to do that. But if we really want to succeed in producing learning, that's, that's what it's going to, to take. Uh, and then by outreach, we, we've talked about that. that. That faculty member who goes beyond. At the end of the day, education, I, um, I think about what I would hope for our students. And, and some of you have heard me tell this, but my, as, my, as an undergraduate, my goal was memorize, regurgitate, and leave, never to go back again. <clears throat> and I got into my first job in 40 hours a week, and I said, I can't do this the rest of my life. So two years later, I was back in a master's program. And I there are two unique experiences. I went home one night at the end of a long day, had kids, I was working full time, slammed my book after class down on the counter, said, I'm done. I'm done, I can't do this anymore. And, and my wife said, uh, well, you can do what you want, I'll support you no matter what, but just remember the time will have gone by anyway. You may as well have something to show for it. And I, uh, okay. Not long after that, something happened. Something clicked. And I, it was an, uh, an epiphany. I said, I want to spend the rest of my life learning. And not just about what I'm studying in this course or in my degree. I want to learn about everything. Now that's the impact of a teacher. And, and, but it's hard work. And it, it takes putting yourself out there. Okay. Now we can, I'm, I'm just about done. Uh, I would say, and, and then we can, we have what, 15 minutes, 10 minutes to talk. I would say um, it, it comes back at the end of the day to the, the four questions. Do our students know what they should know? Can they do what they should be able to do? Have we helped them develop values that are appropriate to their lives and professions? And are they achieving their life and career goals? And if we can answer those four questions in the affirmative, and we have to ha ask ourselves a fifth, how do we know that they know and can do? And that's what assessment is about. But if we can answer those four questions, people will flock to us. Um, Profitability doesn't come by pursuing profitability. Profitability comes by doing things that make people want to engage with you and learn from you. 
And when we do that, that other stuff takes care of itself. So my goal for all of us is that we'll figure out ways to really engage with our students, that, that we can make the affective tunnel bigger so that we can go through and grab students and pull them through. And uh, anyway, I'm so appreciative of this opportunity. I love this place. And I love the dedication of our, of our staff and our faculty and the devotion to students. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be and honored to be a part of, uh, of you. So questions? Any comments? It doesn't need to be a question. Respond, react. Motivating. Um, I think what I've been doing and working with harder in my classes is the notion, and I'm in human services, so it might be a little more amenable to our study, but to think globally but act locally and encouraging students, how does this work in your own community? How would you go about uh, implementing change in your own communities? And then what's really kind of uh, fun is that because of the diversity of our students, and the geographical diversity of our students to exchange ideas. And I think that that's been uh, really beneficial for students to see that they're empowered enough that they can make some changes. So that's, that's all really I had. That's terrific. Thank you. And I love that concept of bringing it down locally again. Uh, I, I used to, when I would teach theory, because university is about theory, but it's about how it works, I would ask my students, so we just studied this theory. I want you to search back in your memory for something, some experience you've had or something you've seen happen that helps explain, that this theory helps you understand better and explain. So it's bringing it down to them. Who else? Yes? Yes. Yeah, the question is, will the chain move to Canvas give us opportunities to make changes? Canvas is a lot more flexible. There are, there are apps that we can uh, bolt on to it that will seamlessly integrate. Uh, one of the really cool things is the big blue button. T Andy, what's the big blue button? Um, it's a big blue button. Questions are more. Hang on. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, like Craig's. So like Craig said, um, we have a lot of opportunity with Canvas, a very open system, eCollege, a very closed system, to look at all sorts of different tools, and tools that we can both look externally as well as create and serve as an overlay onto our current discussion forums to make them more like the kinds of interfaces that students are used to in their everyday lives, Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, but um, the Big Blue Button is a free tool that comes with Canvas, and it offers the opportunity to do live um, chats, live webinars, the kinds of things we're doing right now with Craig and students um, that comes with each class that each faculty member can use, automatically records and populates inside the classroom for students who didn't get a chance to see it live to go back and watch it. And honestly, it's just one of a plethora of different things that are out there. So we're excited about the move to Canvas and what we can do with forms. Oh, good. Good point, um, Poppy. Yeah, so if you're a student and you're hearing this, first of all, don't tell anyone else. Um, <laughs> second of all, um, in May of 2017, we're going to be making a move to a new learning management system. There's nothing for you to worry about. It'll be a seamless migration. Um, but just know you're going to go from kind of an old, outdated system to a new, modern one, and you should be excited about it. I think we have time for one or two more. Just real quick on the discussions, making them a little bit more um, meaningful or beneficial. Is there any talk about um, uh, having some sort of synchronous component to the discussions when they transition to Canvas? Um, you know, I think there's something to be gained when you're actually engaged in a you know real time dialogue. You no, know, I I absolutely love that idea, and Andy knows I've been talking about it forever. If I love the synchronous, the real time component. Even if it's just something that, you know, if, if I was teaching and, and, and uh, scheduled and, and office hours and during the, those office hours as many people that wanted to come, uh, we, we could discuss what was going on and deepen their learning. And it wouldn't, may not apply to everybody, but you know, people may not want to do it, but those who did 
that would be super. Right. Just because they want to be there. So <clears throat> another part of teaching for me is getting to know my students first. And it seems uh, in our current model, we have one introduction and then we're right into the teaching. And so part of me feels like, why not use the first week to really deeply connect uh, with the student, the students that are in the classroom, and then that then jump into the next week where we begin the learning. And the more that students, because they're isolated online so often, the more they feel connected to the instructor and their fellow students in that course, then they're going to stay engaged for the rest of the entire course. I think, I think you're absolutely right on. And anything that we can do to, to do that. Now, and that's where I think social media kinds of bolt-ons might come in, where there is a class community that exists separate. Now, you'd have to, those, those could get out of control, and you have to watch that. But, but there are some really cool things that we could do. And I think that's a great idea. One more. Just piggybacking off of what everyone's saying, I really think that social media is the way to get to most of the online students today. If you think about how many times people look at their phones all day long, and I, I'm one of these advocates that don't believe that looking at your phone all day and not talking to the person next to you is a good thing, but in an online environment, if you have students who, from the beginning of a class, if you set up an online uh, Facebook account that's just for that classroom, you'd be surprised how many students would be engaged from day one, from the moment that they step into that class, if they had an assignment that's based on an online social media event. I believe that they would be engaged from the beginning. They would have that opportunity to engage with the students, with their fellow, with their instructor, um, with each other on a regular basis. Somehow online uh, students and social media have to go hand in hand from the beginning because that's how you're really going to get them to be active and to, I think, we will have a better retention rate at that point because online, online media and social media is what everybody is into. It is. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Poppy sent me a, a link to one, uh, San Jose State is doing scholarship uh, applications using Pinterest. I thought about that, when I looked at that, I thought about it in relation to the competency-based program and how that cool that would be if that's the way, I, I could see that being a way that students create something for that course where they're pinning things and, and talking about it and getting people to respond. I mean, there, there are any number of things that we can do. I, I'm so excited about the potential. And we need to reinvent online education. So, and, and we're in the process. So anyway, thank you all. <laughs>